do you get the call or do you make the call? I get the call. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is my worst thing moment. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Women with Balls, where I, Katie Balls, speak to today's trailblazers. My guest today was born in Glasgow, where she started her career in journalism as a football reporter. A fellow colleague said, she turned up for work one day and just kept coming back. This driven nature continued throughout her career, moving to work for the Conservative Party as a press officer, then later selected by Theresa May to be her closest ally at the Home Office. In 2016, when May became Prime Minister, she moved to number 10 as the first female chief of staff in Downing Street. She covered all areas of May's political career, from the Modern Slavery Act, Brexit negotiations to the 2017 general election. She resigned after that general election when the Conservatives lost their majority. Now, she runs her own strategic consultancy, specialising in policy, reputation and crisis management. Described by one former colleague, that she's a woman is neither here nor there, she's just a professional. My guest today is Fiona Hill. Now, to begin on this podcast, Fiona, and thank you for joining because you've been a very high on my list of people I've been very keen to get on for some time. Thank you, Katie. Um, would you describe yours as a happy childhood? Overall, yes. Um, I am exceptionally close to my siblings. Um, my sister, Amy, is um, 12 years younger than me, so she keeps me young. Um, and my brother is four years younger, and we're just really, really tight. And... Also, my mother is a force of nature and just very cool, really. Um, so the mixture of that combination was a happy part. Um, there was a few challenges with my father and they got divorced. Um, so that was a less happy part. But I'd never really think about that too much because I think every child has a, cha- has a challenge. But overall, pretty happy. And what were you like at school? Were you well behaved? Were you a force of nature like your mother? What was the vibe? Um, a set of contradictions, Katie. Um, I worked hard-ish um, sometimes. Um, and I was fairly straight-laced. Um, but I also have quite a mischievous character. And every now and then I, I might have exercised that. <laughs> um, any any examples? Is oh, I'm so old now, you see, yeah. Katie. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the teachers loved you. I was always the teacher's pet. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, and was politics discussed much in your family growing up? Yes, yeah. very much so. I mean, that was the thing that we spoke about at lunch, dinner. You know, it was something that I remember speaking about very, very early on in my life. I remember mum telling me that when I was five I refused to watch John Craven's news round because it was too boring and I wanted to watch the news at nine as it was then um, and then I told my mother that I would become a journalist and then go into politics um, so I think I pretty much set my own strategy and <laughs> stuck to it. <laughs> um, let's talk about that career in journalism because I mentioned in the introduction um, you were a football reporter for a I while was. and p- perhaps Scotland's first female football Reporter. I think I might have been. There was another girl who came on the scene not long after me, but I can't because I don't like, uh, you know, pretending. Um, I, I, I do think I was the first, um, but she definitely came on. I can't remember her name now, but she worked on one of the other Glasgow newspapers. Um, if you're a football reporter, are you allowed to have your favourite team, or are you supposed to be neutral? Um, I think you're probably supposed to be neutral. Um, but fortunately for me, I was always um, on the big games like Cowd and Beef versus uh, Berwick. Uh, so it was, it was easier to be, shall we say, um, neutral with the smaller teams. And um, um, what was, and I wondered first, how did you get into football reporting? And two, what was, the, what was it like at the time? Did you have, because I think we see lots today about sports reporting and how females, particularly in football, aren't taken so seriously. Did you have much of that? I think that's fair to say. Um, I mean, I I, I saw the funny side of it because it was so preposterous, um, really. I mean, I I got into it because um, when I was leaving university, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. And actually, in truth, I think I probably needn't have gone to university, even though I quite enjoyed it, because I really did know what I wanted to do. Um, And I took a job as a receptionist on the Daily Record and Sunday Mail because I thought I'd use that as a, a launch pad into 
the editorial side. So I sent um, the editor, Malcolm Speed, who was very nice, um, a copy of my CV with a tea bag staple to it saying, enjoy over a cuppa. Um, and he seemed to find this quite amusing. Breakfast tea. Um, actually, it's probably Tetley's. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. very sophisticated then, Katie. Um, obviously, I am now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, he, he liked that. And so he said, OK, let's give you some work experience on the free sheet, which was called the Glaswegian. And um, I did my work experience there. And I had a cent centre page splash after a couple of days. and realised actually I, I quite enjoyed this and they realised I was fairly good at it. Um, and then oh. someone, I, I don't know who, came up with the idea that actually they should make me do football. Um, and so I did football. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you mentioned earlier on that your early career plan from a young age was obviously journalism and then moved to politics. So even when you were doing football reporting, was that still what you had yes. vaguely in mind? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I came from the west coast of Scotland and I didn't have a big contacts book um, and no one in my family had any position in journalism and politics and I, and I worked out that the way of getting to the place I wanted to be in politics was going through journalism and making contacts that way. So at what point do you then, you had a brief stint doing PR because my editor, before yeah. we recorded this, Fraser Nelson, um, said that you once tried to help organise his stag do. And I'm so, a very, very helpful and resourceful person. <laughs> I can turn my hand to anything. <laughs> um, so what was the PR stage of your career like? Did you um, like it all? I'd been working at Sky News uh, as deputy news editor and I was acting up as news editor and I started to look at you know, well, when do I go into politics? Because obviously I'd had that always in, in my mind. Um, and I then also worked out that it was highly unlikely that I would ever be made, you know, head of domestic news because there are just so few of those jobs in broadcasting um, and the competition is quite stiff and there are very few women. Um, so I thought, well, OK, maybe it's time to, to move. And I went to the uh, Conservative Party conference uh, the the one where David Cameron and Dee Dee and so forth were doing the leadership um, campaign. And I saw um, David speaking in, in a warm up and I just thought, actually, really like this guy. I think this is the time to go into politics. I always knew I was a conservative. And so I ended up in this PR job because I left Sky because a friend who worked there uh, persuaded me to go there. But it was the worst three months of my life. Um, I was terrible at it and um, I just hated it so much and then I was fortunate enough to have an introduction made with uh, Henry McCrory and Michael Salter who worked at CCHQ and the rest is history. Um, why did you always know you were a conservative? Were your parents conservatives? Or my um... grandmother very much was and, and my mother. Uh, for me I guess it was a reaction to growing up in a very labour place and I didn't really like their attitude uh, to many things actually and also I really don't want the state interfering in my life and I don't think that the state should be the answer to everything and I felt that when I was younger um, and that it, it just kind of gradually moved I guess uh, from, from there, it was, it was an instinctive thing for me really. So you joined the Conservative Party press office, and this is when the yeah. Tories are in opposition. Correct. Um, so what is the mood like? Does it feel as though they're on the cusp of something, or is no one quite sure yet? Well, I joined in January 2007. What year did David become leader? It was in November 2000. Whatever January it was after he became yeah. leader, that's when I joined. Um, and... You know, I just had a ball, actually, Katie balls, <laughs> um, because I, I just loved I the people that I worked with. Um, and, you know, we had so much fun. And I think that we worked really, really well as a team. It was probably a bit early at that stage to think that we were on the cusp of something. But all I know is that the atmosphere was right because we were all fairly young, um, fairly bright and knew what we wanted to do and how to do it and you know David and George were very very good at, at leading in opposition 
and you know it was just fun you know um when did you meet Theresa May um I think actually I first met Theresa May when I was a journalist at Sky um probably at a party conference but the first time I got to know her um vaguely well was one of the other press officers I had a couple of weeks off and I stood in for her um and then worked for her for a couple of weeks and I think I got her a front page splash because I made her write to Sir Alan Sugar complaining about something um so I think that stuck in her mind um so when she went to the home office a mixture of her and and obviously Nick and I knew each other in opposition and got on very very well um so that's how the uh, the team came together and did you immediately see in her the type of politician where you had quite similar values um, I, I didn't know her well enough to make that judgment in opposition, really. Um, that took a bit of time being in the Home Office and getting to know her a bit more personally. Um, so we've, we've skipped to the point where the Tories are now in power yeah. and obviously you're in the Home Office with Theresa May. And I wonder, what, what was the transition like from obviously uh, working in the Tories in opposition, speaking all the positives, to suddenly you're in what many regard as the trickiest mm. department there's a reason it's often called, you know, the graveyard of ambitions because it's just so large. That yeah. There are lots of problems. We've seen home secretaries such as Amber Rudd, you know, struggle, struggle with it. Um, so how how does your job change? For, is, it, is it quite daunting at that point? I mean, it's, it's a kind of vertical learning curve that unless you've experienced it, you can't really understand it. I mean, one of the reasons that I called my uh, consultancy Marsham Street Consultants is because I just loved being there. I mean, I absolutely loved that job. And I loved, because I really do like learning, and I loved the pace at which I had to learn, how much I had to read, how much I had to get under the skin of the department, the, the scale of the, the challenge, always quite like a challenge and everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I just felt very, very motivated and really happy that I was learning that much that quickly, because you really do go from uh, a knowledge of, of uh, very little really apart from how journalism works or you know how you think about policy to this big operational department where there's risk everywhere and there's nothing more intellectually satisfying than, than working in a risk environment for me I, I just completely you know get off on it if that's the right terminology <laughs> probably not for spectator listeners um but yeah I mean it's what it's what makes me jump out of bed in the morning and also, actually, I had become very immersed in the modern slavery agenda, and we yeah. just finished the the legislation. But the legislation I knew only covered off and and helped one um, angle of modern slavery, and I'd become very very interested in the security side of it, the organised crime part of it. So that's when I went to the CSJ and researched and wrote a paper looking at organised crime in relation to trafficking across Europe. Yeah, because I was going to say one of the questions I have is one of our contributors, James Kirkup, uh, once suggested it's probably fair to say that Mrs. May only talks about modern slavery because of Miss Hill. Um, I don't think you'd go that far, but... Well, I mean, there, there was a day that I was speaking about it so much that she asked me to stop. <laughs> but, but you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I see something that, that I, I feel passionate about, I, I do become borderline obsessed. So, um, Just on modern slavery, I wonder, because it's one of the things I think to this day is seen as the legacy of Theresa May. And we'll talk more about the Theresa May premiership, of course, but what was it that then made it something that you were so focused in on? Was it a particular experience? or No, I mean... I defy anyone who sits down and hears the story of someone who's been trafficked and then exploited to not then become quite obsessed with it and to understand really what lies behind it. I've, I've met women and men who have told me stories that I couldn't even tell you on, on your podcast, I'm afraid. But once you hear those stories, you can't unhear them. Um, and just the sheer tragedy. I mean, one woman who had been trafficked from, from Africa... Um, she went through the most horrendous abuse and she was only 26 when I spoke to her and she'd just been diagnosed with breast cancer that day and I couldn't believe how unlucky one person could be and that when you know that and you know that you're working in a an environment that you you can do something about it even if it's a tiny thing you, you can't go to bed at night and not you just can't yeah. and 
the more I looked into it, the more I realised that this wasn't just a social condition or a social issue, um, and it wasn't just a migration issue. Really, at its heart, it was organised crime. And organised criminals are so agile and so better at, at getting things done than governments that I became very passionate and, and uh, you know, just very serious about how we could get government and its institutions to be a bit clever and understand really what was lying behind it. Because organised crime is, you know, illegal firearms, it's, it's uh, drug crime, and yet human trafficking wasn't seen in that bundle, but it makes huge amounts of profits for organised criminals. Huge. Would you say there was a gap in the law on it? Or? There's a huge gap yeah. and there still is. Still is. Um, and we set up the Modern Slavery Task Force to try and uh, fill that gap. And we had the head of MI6, head of MI5, the head of MOD Intelligence, because to, to come down hard on something like organised crime in the same way that you do for counter-terrorism, you really need multidisciplinary uh, teams to be able to do it. And I knew that they weren't doing it and I wanted them to do it. So I thought, well, let's eyeball them and see if we can get them to do it. Um, now, you have your period outside of government. And then in 2016, we're going to skip past the EU referendum because otherwise we're never going to leave this room. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, we all know what happens. Leave wins. David Cameron no longer feels able to stay in his place. He steps down. Lots of people think this is going to be a Boris Johnson coronation. Instead, Theresa May um, enters the race and, and the rest is history. Um, at what point do you start to work for Theresa May in terms of her bid to be leader? Uh, about two hours after David resigned. And do you get the call or do you make the call? I get the call. <laughs> <laughs> you know when, uh, I don't know if you've watched The West Wing, I assume you probably of have. Of course. So you know the episode where um, Sam is in this very boring corporate meeting talking about, about shipbuilding M&A or something similar um, and Josh basically knocks on the glass window and says it's time. I've always wanted to be in that position. <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, oh my God, this is my West Wing moment. <laughs> um, and at the time, did you, did you, were you confident she had a good chance of winning? Because I, I was, think lots of... I was convinced she was going to win. Yeah. We were very prepared. I mean, we pretty much had everything in place before, if I'm honest, David resigned. Yeah. Um, so we knew exactly what we were doing. And one of the reasons I thought she would win, despite... Uh, it looking like it was because Boris dropped out. Um, I knew that she could bridge the gap between both sides of the party, the Remain and the Brexit. And at that time, that was very, very critical. Um, and people knew that she was reliable. She'd done five years fairly untarnished at the Home Office. And ultimately, that shows a credibility that, that no one else could show. So although everyone just assumed that Boris would get it, and, and I didn't work on that assumption. Yeah. Um, so Theresa May is crowned, crowned's the wrong word, but Theresa May becomes prime minister and you become the first ever female chief of staff. Yeah, um, joint chief of staff. Joint chief, yeah. We'll get, Nick Timothy can have a bit of space, <laughs> but he's spoken enough. <laughs> so, so you become the first female co-chief of staff um, alongside Nick Timothy, who's your home office colleague. Um, what's it like your first day in number 10? Are you, just talk, just talk us through it. I remember I was walking towards number 10 and a number of my friends who worked for David Cameron were walking towards the cabinet office because they were leaving. And I remember thinking, I don't like this feeling. I don't like watching my friends leave. Um, I knew why they were leaving because they were all exhausted after the Remain campaign. Um, but I do remember feeling that this was not likely to be a happy time. And indeed, it was not. That's really interesting. Was that, was that down to specific reason, which was just a feeling? Because obviously you had the tricky task. So that's an understatement of Brexit. Um, was it that? Was it, just, was it just a sense? I mean, the, the sense of shock that reverberated around that building for a very long time was palpable. And it never quite left in the time that I was there. People just couldn't believe what had happened. 
And that was before we got into the negotiations and, and how we actually even start the, the negotiation. And again, I think that in certain meetings, there was a, just a general sense that continued of, of you know, disbelief that we were even having these conversations. So, so that Brexit had happened, yeah. that David Cameron had got, it was a combination of... I mean, it was just that Brexit had happened yeah. and, and it did feel yeah. like the surface of the sun in there. You know, it, it something big had happened and, and it, for me anyway, I, I, uh, I didn't find, although I'd always wanted to have that job, I didn't find, or at least I had to work harder to try and Mm, s- scope it in a way that I would at least get something out of it. Because that's one of the things about moving to Downing Street, whereas you have some people who in departments do very well, but then they move to Downing Street and I mean this across lots of different roles, but it's just such a different way of working. Very different way of working, um, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's not as operational as a, a department like the Home Office is. But I was okay with that because I was fairly interested in the NSC and, and that agenda, and that's pretty op- operational. Um, and then actually just trying to keep, I don't know, a sense of calm um, in the country by announcing things or doing things that, that allayed people's fears of, well, what's next? Um, and that's what we were trying to do. I think we were fairly successful at doing that in you know before the election of... 2017 that will forever be etched all over my body. <laughs> well, I was going to say, initially, the polls were recording, you know, huge support. There was what some described as May mania yeah. um, in terms of, uh, and I think you go to that local election result, which was not that long before the general election, yes. and the Tories were, you know, actually in a, a very positive place. So it felt as though in the initial days and weeks, it, w- it was going to plan. Did it feel like that on the inside? Yeah. Yeah. I felt like it was going to plan until we got into the 2017 election. So on that, Theresa May calls the election. It's after there have been strong suggestions she would not do that. Mm. Um, what, did, you, did you support the decision to call an early election? Or? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I still think it was the right... I think it was the only thing that we had to do because the majority was so slim... And if you look now back with hindsight, how difficult it has been since then, there there was no way that we couldn't try it out and have an election. And and, and based on, as you said, Katie, the polls indicated that we would win fairly well. Um, What, of course, you can't peek into your thinking is whether or not the campaign you ultimately run has the right momentum. And I don't think the 2017 election campaign ever really had the right momentum for a, for a number of reasons, some in our gift and a, a lot outside our control. But with election campaigns, they're almost like the voodoo that you know so well. Um, you can get luck and you can also get bad luck and it doesn't matter if you've got your messages right or this and that right or wrong. Um, sometimes it's just a quite unquantifiable uh, momentum or or indeed otherwise. There's always a bit of luck in politics too. <laughs> yeah, and um, life in general. What do you think went wrong that was in the control, I suppose, of Theresa May, those around her? Um, well, I, I mean, I think, I don't think, I didn't get a sense that she was really enjoying it. Yeah. Um... And I think that ultimately journalists pick up on that in a campaign. Um, I think, and I think it's documented that I wasn't a supporter of the social health care policy. Um, it was a very long campaign. I mean, it took me weeks to catch up on sleep. I mean, it really it was a tough campaign. What was it about the social care policy specifically that you just... Well, I, I'd worked with Jeremy Haywood on it in gov- when we were actually number 10. Um, and I knew that it had been tested properly. Um, it had only been tested inside the confines of the civil service. My view was to really get under the uh, the skin of, of what, what it was, is that it should go out to see like the King's Fund or some go out somewhere and be tried and tested and then come back into government. 
I of course understand that we need to do something about so social health care, but I didn't feel like this policy, which was a complex policy, complex, but if something's complex to understand or, or to communicate, then it means that it hasn't been tried and tested enough. And yeah. I didn't feel it had been. Yeah, we see that a lot in yeah. the, current, the more uh, recent governments. Um, I suppose I wonder just on election night, was there a point when you thought perhaps the Tories would lose that election? Was there a point before it? Or and if not, I wondered... There, the was, a, poll, there was really. a moment after the Manchester um, arena bombing where we were uh, travelling by plane up to uh, Manchester and the window, uh, cockpit window, shattered. And we had to drop uh, a couple of... I'm, I'm terrible with metrics, I'm afraid, but we had to... Um, Drop from You're the sky, <laughs> but not to the ground. <laughs> so somewhere happy in between. Right. Um, and and I hadn't really been feeling particularly great about the general direction of the campaign anyway. But there was something about that moment that, that I, I felt was a bit of an omen and that I felt, like I said, you know, some bad things happen during campaigns and, um, and it's hard you know, to campaign for politics when people have lost their life. I mean, you know, a really ugly thing had happened. You're not going out and staying strong and stable too much after that. Yeah. Um, and so that slows everything down, and it, and it has to. It absolutely has to. Um, but overall, I, I just felt things were not going to plan. And when the exit poll came through... Because I remember coming through just doing the live blog from next door and it was a slightly like spit your tea out of your mug <laughs> moment. What was your reaction? Well, um, one of the best things I did that uh, day stroke evening was um, I got my sister to come into CCHQ. Um, and I, I think it must have been around maybe 10 to 5 to 10. But as you can imagine, my memory's a bit blurry. And... Andy Marr called me and told me what the exit poll was. And I felt like basically I'd been kicked in the stomach. And I was aware that I was there in, in body, but I wasn't really there at all in my mind. Um, and I was just so grateful for my sister being there because you know she kind of directed me almost. Um, and then of course I had to tell Nick and then I had a call from Teresa asking me to go down to the constituency, which I did, but I don't think I was there very long. She had her count, and then I was in another car coming back up to CCHQ. And my sister had stayed on in the hotel room I was staying in, thank goodness. Um, and then I got there about five o'clock in the morning, and she'd already packed up all my clothes and poured me into a taxi. And the Good rest, sister. Yeah, she, she's a wonderful <laughs> sister. Um, and I, I felt bad for my sister and particularly for my brother during that period because my brother uh, was a BBC journalist in Westminster and I can't imagine how it would have felt for him going into work the next day. I felt quite guilty about that. Um, so all in all, it was um, what we probably would describe as a low point in one's career. Do you think the three months in the PR firm were still worse? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Probably. <laughs> My sister wasn't there. <laughs> um, in the days that followed, of course, you know, MPs are losing their mind. There's obviously a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. The deal is being forged with the DEP, through Gavin Williamson, and lots of MPs start calling, you know, saying, oh, we can't get Theresa May, so we're going to call for the head of her two powerful aides, yourself and Nick. So did you feel like you had no choice but to resign? Um, yeah, I mean, I was forced to resign. Did you, did you I didn't I didn't personally think that I should be resigning um, because I didn't really feel like I'd necessarily done anything massively wrong. Um, maybe with hindsight, I don't know, maybe I did. Uh, someone else can be the judge of that. It's difficult for me to do it for myself. Um, but just, you know, straightforwardly, you know, she called me and said, you have to resign. So I resigned. It must be tricky in politics when you've obviously dedicated so much it's obviously your career too in the sense 
as we said, you're the first ever female co-chief of staff, as well as football reporter. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, so it's a very impressive career in its own right. But obviously, mm. you're dedicating years of your life to a politician's career. It must be strange in a way when obviously the politician keeps going, but you're almost potentially collateral. Yeah. Is that, is that something you felt at all or is it not really I, I seen felt, it? I felt that acutely. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, she had to keep going. And I understand the rules of politics and life and I understood that I had to be collateral damage and she did the right thing sacking us. I mean Nick Nick was already resigning anyway. Um and you know, as much as I understood all the reasons for the weeks and months that followed I felt like there was a lack of protection around me and what was written about me. And a, a lot of what was written about me wasn't entirely accurate. And I found that quite hard, even though as a former journalist, I know how it works um, and I know how politics works. And now, you know, of course, I accept it. It's not, not a thing anymore. But at the time, it was just really horrible actually no I was going to ask you that because it just felt a bit like it became like a feeding frenzy to, it felt to it felt like that yeah and I didn't bother complaining about it because I knew well firstly I didn't know who to complain to um and secondly I knew that it was a frenzy so it was unlikely that anything I said would stop the frenzy the one thing I would say though is and I still believe this that for a fairly young woman <laughs> not, not that young, um, who lives by herself, um, to be allowed to be thrown to the wolves like that was potentially not very good. Luckily, I'm a strong person, but if I'd been a lesser person, I may have thrown myself in the Thames. Um, and then after about three or four weeks, you know, someone tried to break into my flat and it turned out that it was probably a political thing he laughed when I screamed he laughed um so these were all the byproducts of having your uh profile raised in that kind of way and I think too often in politics people forget that actually we are all human beings and that sometimes you can take the collateral because you know that that's the game but I don't think that there's any harm in having some form of safety net for those people who are taking that collateral. And did you have any support kind of after uh, reach out, you know, protection? My, my mother, my brother, my sister. Um, because it felt as though it was a period where Nick Timothy was in lots of places, obviously writing columns, and you almost kind of went to ground. Did I felt that I wanted to understand what had just happened, and I didn't feel that I, I had all the uh, the facts to hand because it all happened in such a high octane way that I just needed time to um, really analyse everything that had taken place and my own place in it. Um, and also, I just, I, I, I didn't really feel that I had anything of any consequence to say at that point. And also I'm very discreet and loyal. And if I had said anything at that point, I'd have only fed the frenzy and that wouldn't have been helpful to anyone. I mean, Nick was different because he was given a column in the Daily Telegraph. Um, so that allowed him to make the next step into journalism and he'd always wanted to eventually do that. But I didn't want to do that. And I made the calculation that I needed to let the frenzy pass and then rebuild my life. And I wasn't likely to be able to do that during a frenzy. Now, I want to talk about the things you're doing now. The final thing I just wanted on that was in that time and re reflecting, is there anything, you know, when you've had that time away, I think, were you in America for a while? I went to stay with my poor friend, uh, Laura in New York, who has... <laughs> I mean, basically three months of saying, Laura, how do I turn a computer on? Or Laura, um, could you just fix this IT problem? Because, you know, un until then, I'd not really, I mean, we had PSEs and things in government and then you're back to doing it for yourself. 
Um, and she was a good friend for uh, putting up with me and my IT limitations. Um, did you, is there anything with, with hindsight, having had that time to reflect, you would have done differently from the time? It's very, in truth, it's a, it was a very difficult period for me, uh, Katie, because uh, my partner had been diagnosed with cancer. And so for me, a lot of it is a bit of a blur yeah. because I was keeping it all together. And would I do anything differently? Probably, but I couldn't point to one thing. Yeah. But evidently I'm not in that job anymore. So something went wrong. <laughs> and, what, you know, and, I, and I take my responsibility for, for you know, whatever went wrong as much as I'm sure Nick and Teresa would. I mean, no one seems to stay in that job very long these days. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> um, so now outside of government, um, you've spoken a bit about uh, the consultants you're doing now. You're also for a time back at the CSJ. Yeah. Um, so in terms of your day-to-day -day now, what is your focus? Uh, you know, what you spoke a bit about um, how in the home office, you know, it's like getting up and high stakes and it's what gets you going is, yeah. is that what you have now too i do i've, I've got myself and and it has taken a taken a long time i mean you know 2017 was five years ago um i'm glad i took my time actually i think it's good to go slow when you're rebuilding because you want to get the next phase of your life absolutely right and i feel like i've got there and a bit like i was saying in relation to general election campaigns, having that momentum and things just start working and you can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and you know that, um, and everyone has this, you have your moments when you in life where you go through your downturn and you just have to get through it. But then you start realising that you're going through the next phase again, which is the good the good times before you ultimately get to the bad times again let's face it but <laughs> <laughs> but um but you, you know I, i've got i've got a sense that when i get out of bed in the morning i'm doing interesting things i'm speaking to interesting people um the clients i have are um diverse and just very very interesting interesting regions and so forth um and now i'm, I'm about to well not about to i'm already starting to organize an international security conference which we'll have here in the uk um nothing to do with the uk government um, i'm organizing this by myself and that will be next october on the 9th and the 10th um i can't say yet where it will be but it's a pretty groovy uh venue and that will keep me occupied <laughs> for a while um so I, yeah i mean i i've uh I've, I've, I've made a life for myself, which I'm very, very comfortable in. Um, you once ran for a seat, I think. And that's like my... I was on the list, but the I didn't list. ever go for any seats. But you're not tempted now. Oh, good, goodness. No. <laughs> from everything you're saying, I, I would presume it was a no, but just, just wanted to... Just... I, I do not cherish the job of <laughs> MP. Um, I just have two final questions. The first was just one, which is we're currently obviously in more Tory turbulence. Mm. How much of a problem do you think are political grudges in politics? I don't. I don't think it's just, or rather, I don't think uh, division applies just to the Tory party or indeed Westminster. I think the division is the byproduct of a very changing world, and a world that's changing in a way that. Is, uh, is, is quite concerning. And because things are starting to get quite serious, we all know that the risks involved and the threats um, that we're facing are, are fairly big and probably of the kind that we've never thought we would see in our generation. And ultimately, I think that is making people uh, quite anxious and in terms of what we do about it or what those people who work in politics do about it i think that they have to see the bigger picture we can't have a population living in fear they need to feel like the people who are paid to lead have to lead and those who lead have to understand that 
that threat isn't just a foreign policy or a security threat anymore. It's a threat that people actually feel in their own homes. Um, and I'm not talking about mortgages and all that. I'm talking just people waking up in the morning, listening to the news, watching the news. They, they, they know things are changing. They worry about their children, their grandchildren, what kind of world that they, they will live in. And we, or those in power, need to steward the country through that. Now, the final question is one I ask everyone on this podcast, which is, um, what is the worst advice you've ever been given? And you could have taken it, or you could have just completely ignored it. I have a feeling you may have ignored it. <laughs> I, I, you're, that feeling would be right. <laughs> well, actually, there's two uh, pieces of advice that I didn't think in the end happened to be very good. One I did take and regretted it, and then the other one I didn't take. Oh, fab, let's have both. Okay, so the one that I didn't take um, in Scotland, and I don't know if you had this when you were at school in Scotland, um, we had a thing called career advisors. My mother is a career advisor. Oh no. No, you might be about, no, don't worry, she's oh, retired no. now. Okay. She was a brief career advisor in Scottish school, so this is, this is particularly good now. Okay. Well, my career advi- advisor was um, a man who was quite rotund and uh, shiny, uh, shall we say. And I went to him and I said, I want to be a journalist. And he said, I wouldn't do that. He said, you don't know anyone in journalism. It's a very nepotistic industry. You'll never get a job. And I was absolutely incandescent. So I sat down and I wrote a letter to the headmaster. And I said, I just don't think that it's very good for career advisors to tell people they can't do something. We should be telling people they can do something. And then became a journalist. So see ya. Take um, and then the less fortunate piece of advice, which I actually did <laughs> <laughs> did take up was um, on the Friday morning I found out that I got my job at the Scotsman and I was obviously super excited about this because I'd always wanted to work on the Scotsman and especially that old building which is now a, a hotel it was a real romantic dream I had and so rather excitedly I hit a Glasgow nightclub with a few friends and we ordered some Sambuca and my friend said to me you need to light your Sambuca which I did but then burnt my lips, so started uh, <laughs> the first day, uh, the job that I'd been pining for for many years with, shall we say, a slightly swollen lip. Some people would pay for that these days. Um, do you know, actually, maybe I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Better than an injection. And <laughs> um, with that, thank you for joining us, Stephen. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Katie.